Hi, this is James Ng with Old Capital, and this is the February 2024 multifamily financing webinar. And this this month, I'm calling calling the webinar or the theme for this month is workout. And so, not like your gym workout, but your your lone workout. And uh, so, what we're going to go through this month is a lot of earnings calls, a lot of different. Uh, things moving out there. And so I want to start with this quote from one of the earnings calls is we are in a period of peak stress and expect the next two quarters to be challenging, if not more challenging than the fourth quarter of 2023. And they said, working these deals out is an art, not a science. There's no specific uh, one that is the same. You have different sponsors, different capabilities, different assets, different bases, different ability to get capital. And some need more, some less capital, and we approach each one independently. And so that was from um, the Arbor call, and we will get into what exactly they're seeing in their portfolio and their book. Um, so the agenda for uh, this month is really talking about where we are in the cycle, uh, what we're seeing across earnings calls, uh, the market forecast for the, the various markets, and then also talking about financing. And so if you want this deck, um, what I would like you to do is uh, subscribe to the channel, like the video, uh, share the video, and then um, just send me an email and I will put up a link to the deck um, to you so you don't have to try to snapshot pictures and things like that. All right. So, um, you know, where are we in the cycle, I think, is a question that, you know, in January, we were out at NMHC and talking to a lot of people and trying to figure out sort of where we are in the cycle. And, um, you know, I thought this was a good way to start the conversation. And it's really around where the federal funds rate is historically and where it is today. And so we've gone through this huge run up, you know, basically from zero to 525, 550. And sort of, if you look historically, it has sort of sat and flattened out. Uh, I went back and looked. This was about six to eight, six to seven months uh, back in two thousands, uh, and then this in two thousand six, two thousand seven. This sat for about twelve months, and so this hold period where the federal funds rate is, and then essentially the Fed cuts. Um, you know, it starts slow and then goes a lot faster, uh, and they're cutting throughout the recession. And so when you look at where we are today, um, you know, I think it was July of 2023 where they sort of held the rates. And I think they're going to try to hold the rates as long as possible. And the, you know, once they start cutting, uh, we might be into this recession, you know, obviously the 2008, 2009, that was a longer recession, but, you know, some of these are, you know, maybe a year or two. Um, so we'll have to see, but you know, where we are in the cycle right now, it seems like uh, we're coming into something uh, right now. And so we're going to talk about that in terms of some of the earnings calls and what people are seeing. And, you know, the forecast really for, for this year, you know, the CPI came in a little bit higher in January. And so people are sort of, you know, holding for a couple months here um, at this rate. And then really the first, first cut they're seeing maybe in the summer and then, um, you know, maybe getting to about 425 by the end of the year. So, uh, you know, I think everybody's waiting on inflation data. Um, and this is sort of what, uh, you know, it's been sort of stuck around is around that 3%. And so we're waiting to get down to 2%. And I think the Fed's going to hold as long as it can, um, as sort of the uh, CPI and the PCE come down closer to 2%. So we're just waiting though. Um, a lot of people in the market, but, uh, you know, it's good to have time on your side and not time going against you. And a lot of these deals out there that maybe were financed in 21 and 22 on three-year money or three-year ter loan terms, uh, they don't have the, that ability to just sit and wait. And so that's what we're going to get into. Um, in January, if you guys don't follow Howard Marks, Howard Marks put out a memo called easy money. And it talked about, um, you know, probably the last two or three years in 21 and 22 in terms of easy money. And he put this sort of market cycle in there, which I thought, uh, you know, paralleled pretty good with multifamily. And so, you know, it really starts with stimulative rate cuts. Um, so, you know, think about when COVID happened, all the rate cuts that happened with that, the easy money, the PPP money, the everything that was easy, 0% uh, interest rates, all that. Uh, Tenure was less than 1%. 
And so that's, you know, that that's going to spur a lot of positive market development. So think of that 2020. And then if your money is sitting in the bank, you're essentially earning zero on your savings. 10-year treasury was 1%. So you, there's nowhere to put your money at that time. And so what does that do? It leads to willingness to bear increased risk, right? So whether it's bridge loans that came on sort of January 2021, uh, whether it's private equity, whether it's new tech, um, new construction development, which we're going to talk about. And so it was easy to raise money for all these things and um, deploy this money into real estate, deploy this money into tech companies and startups and venture capital. Um, and then it goes to number four, right? So number four is results in unwise decisions and eventually investment losses. So the investments in 21 and 22, if you do not have a long enough time horizon, you don't have enough loan term, you don't have enough capital, it's going to lead to foreclosures in 23 and 24. And so we saw some in 23, and now we're starting to see more in 24. Um, and that brings on a period of fear, right? For investors, for investors who have lost money in deals, you know, they feel burned that, you know, making a million, making a hundred thousand dollars is very different than losing a hundred thousand dollars. And so, um, you know, there's going to be not only fear from the investor side, there's going to be fear from the lender side and, um, the money is going to be extremely tight. So that's what we felt in 23. Um, we're feeling it in 24 now, and then potentially into 25, but then this is this is the part of the never ending story, never ending market cycle is that that leads this tight economic contraction is going to lead to more rate cuts, right? So that's what everybody's waiting for. It goes back to easy money and goes to positive market developments, let's say in 25 and into the future. And so uh, it's just a never ending cycle it goes back up to number one. Right. And then the same cycle happens over and over again. Um, so I thought if you haven't read that memo, check out that memo that Howard Marks put out in January um, about easy money and sort of where we are in the cycle. And obviously everything looks easy uh, to look back and predict the future, but, um, you know, or predict the, or talk about the past. But if you look at this, I mean, I think we are definitely right here in number five period of fear, stringency type money in economic contraction. So, um, you know, here is just a snapshot of some of the deals that recently, um, you know, it's all across the nation. Obviously I follow Texas a little bit more, but whether it's Atlanta, uh, this was a deal in Houston. These are deals that were getting foreclosed on. Um, these two, I know in Houston and in Dallas were on bridge loans and just either the operator did not have money for an interest rate cap um, or they just could not service the debt at the level that the loan was at and could not work out a deal with the lender. Um, so it got foreclosed upon. Uh, here was another deal in San Antonio that um, also got foreclosed upon. And so it just looks like um, whether it's just, you know, this occupancy looks okay, uh, but rents have declined, you know, at the peak, you know, in 2022, it was $1,400 rents and now it's 12, 1279. So a lot of these deals, when they were bought, um, let's say in 21 or 22, the goal was to raise the rents and raise the NOI. And so on a lot of these deals, it, it was based on performa. And so if the borrower was not able to hit that performa, then they just there's no way that they're going to be able to refinance the bridge loan that they put on. Um, and so they're just going to have to um, either give the keys back or raise more capital to recapitalize the deal. And so we're just going to start right off the bat with Arbor um, in terms of, so they usually, you know, probably have 15 to 20 minutes of prepared remarks and they probably had about 45 minutes of Q and A and, you know, the, they were talking about, you know, this period of sort of peak stress and, you know, the next two quarters still having more stress, if not even longer. Um, so they're, they're having elevated delinquencies. The, the percentage of delinquencies is getting reported anywhere from 20% uh, down to 2%. So I'm not sure what the what the actual delinquency is. It seems like um, if people miss a payment, that's considered, a lot of people are calling that a delinquency, but um, you know, in Arbor's call, they're really focusing on 30 day or even 60 day delinquencies because it seems like there's a material problem there. Um, and so some borrowers are trying to negotiate with the lender and sort of work this deal out. 
but the problem is that they, they are not making their payment. And so they're defaulting first and then trying to negotiate second. Um, and you know, the lenders are asking for them to bring more capital to the table to pay down the bridge loan so that they can get into a Fannie Freddie or to, you know, put money into an escrow for an interest rate cap, which has gone up significantly. And so um, it's taken some time to sort of work out these deals. Um, so the, the delinquency is, is increasing. Um, you know, they said they had 16 non-performing loans um, up from 12, uh, totaling about 262 million. And then there's also some delinquent loans on the agency side as well. All right. So this is what, uh, you know, we had heard about this. We had seen it a little bit, but, um, you know, the Arbor's call, they went into it a little bit more detail saying that, look, we've got borrowers who are in tough situations and they do not necessarily have the money um, to fix these deals. And so they are bringing in other sponsors uh, that Arbor is familiar with, uh, working to sort of step in and take over these assets. So whether that's a sale or a loan assumption, um, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, you bring additional money to recapitalize the deal uh, with, you know, CapEx dollars, interest reserve dollars, and there's been a lot of demand um, for this. And so it seems like whenever Arbor takes over a deal, if before they've even foreclosed on it, they sort of already know what's what's going to be the change that's going to make this deal uh, really get to a better position. And, you know, they're saying, look, don't, don't um, stop paying us because you're going to have to pay not only uh, default interest, but there could be some 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 ways that that loan could become recourse. So when you look at the loan documents, you have to see, all right, is there a guarantee on the CapEx? Is there a guarantee on the interest reserve? Each one of these uh, loan docs are different. So depending on what you negotiated with your um, attorney and the lender's attorney, um, that's going to determine sort of uh, what what items are recourse and which ones are not. Um, so, you know, Arbor spent a lot of time in the Q and a talking about, look, uh, we do not give a grace period. Uh, we give a lot of credibility or we spend a lot of time on sort of the 30 and 60 day delinquent stuff. Um, but we try to keep these guys current as much as possible. Um, uh, but it's difficult, right? So if the rents come in late and then they've got to go raise capital to put money in, it takes time. And so, um, you know, on a lot of these deals, you know, they think they're going to work them out, not have an issue. But where there's, you know, a borrower who's, you know, fighting the lender the whole time, um, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult and they're probably going to have to end up foreclosing. Um, but they ended up, they ended the call with, look, you know, we, it's going to be two to three quarters of distress. Uh, but they think from a workforce housing perspective, um, you know, there's still a lot of demand. And the one thing that was interesting that they mentioned also was, you know, a lot of people are coming across the border. Uh, you know, they they mentioned, you know, eight to nine million people have come across the border and they're all living in hotels or they're living somewhere. And so eventually once they start working and they're going to have, you know, money in their pocket, uh, a lot of people are going to be moving into, you know, BNC properties. And so I thought that was interesting. And then they also talked about in 2009, 2010, I guess they were only 35% multi and they had a bunch of other asset classes like offices and things like that. And what they realized in the last recession uh, was that they had significant losses on other asset classes. Um, but, you know, with multifamily, good management, every high is generally followed by another high. Um, so they, they feel very strong about multifamily. They feel very strong about workforce housing. Um, so that was, that was Arbor, um, you know, Arbor has significantly more, uh, bridge loan exposure compared to this next lender, the other public lender, Walker and Dunlop, um, you know, they focused in on really Fannie and Freddie and, you know, they, they mentioned how in the fourth quarter, a lot of, a lot of deals were, um, you know, they probably did not work at a 5% 10 year treasury. Uh, but uh, at a 375, they work great. And so, uh, you know, this 100 basis points rally in the fourth quarter uh, has sort of, you know, half been erased right now because, you know, 10 year treasury is probably 425, 430 right now. Um, but it, it's a lot easier. So if the deal worked at four and a half, uh, definitely worked at 375. So a lot of deals came together in the fourth quarter. 
and the volume in the fourth quarter would have been even worse if it stayed at 5%. So, um, you know, a lot of people are sort of asking sort of when the Fed will ease and it's going to have a dramatic impact on the market. So, um, you know, I feel like everybody probably under 4% feels pretty good. Uh, you know, people at 425 are probably okay, but if this 10 year treasury runs back up to five, it's going to be a very, uh, tough year to get a lot of these refis done. Um, you know, Fannie and Freddie are just saying, look, our volume is going to be about the same. And, you know, the, the Walker and Dunlop CEO was just like, that would be pretty disappointing because a lot of deals need to get refied. Uh, so they're expecting, you know, a lot more deals to hit sort of on the Fannie and Freddie side. Um, they had only seven delinquent loans across 3,000 loans, so pretty small uh, number. And then it, it all comes down to equity, right? So right now, most people only raise common equity in 21 and 22. Um, they need a 20% down with the bridge loan. But now to go refinance, you need a substantial uh, amount of new equity, uh, whether that's common or preferred uh, to really recap the deal. And, you know, the name of the game in 2024 is refinancing. So uh, 2024 is still the year of the refi. Um, if you can refi, great. You're going to kick the can out down the road, maybe raise some additional equity. Um, but if you cannot refi, then you're going to have to sell uh, your deal at just sort of the wrong time in the cycle. And so Tides was a big shop that bought, um, you know, they probably have 10,000 units just in Texas. Um, and, you know, across the Sun Belt, they have close to 30 properties. And so their their equity partner at the beginning uh, put in a ton of money, probably a couple hundred million dollars. And now they're saying, look, we're not going to put up any more money. And so they're out trying to raise about $70 million uh, to really either buy interest rate caps or just um, extend these loans and pay down these loans so that they have more time because a lot of their deals were on bridge loans and floating rate. So, um, you know, MMA... MAA is a large REIT, uh, really in the Sun Belt as well. So they bought two deals in, uh, you know, the fourth quarter. They think they're sort of fifteen percent below replacement costs, and you know their yields that they're trying to get to are five and a half to five point nine. Um, so that's not necessarily where they are today. They're saying um, so they bought these deals sort of in lease up. And so they're expecting once it stabilizes, once the concessions burn off, that's sort of where um, their quote unquote cap rate would be. Um, and so, you know, in terms of predicting sort of what they're going to do in 2024, you jump to the bottom. So they have, um, you know, new leases at probably negative three, 3.25 on new leases. And then on the renewals, they have positive four and a half to five percent. So a lot of these leases, you know, they've gone up 15, 20 percent in the last couple of years. And so now those those renewals are catching up. And so uh, while the negative on the new leases is coming down, the you know, the guy who's at 800 bucks uh, and you only bumped them, you know, 50, 60 dollars a month. Now, all of a sudden, he's still positive. Right. So you're taking him from 800 to 850. But the guy who was paying twelve hundred dollars, you're bringing it back down. Um, so blended, they're about one percent for the full year, and they're thinking new lease probably turns positive in two thousand twenty-five, which we'll we'll see on some some other charts about where we see into the supply in two thousand twenty-five, two thousand twenty-six. Um, but you know, MAA, big shop, and you know they could go and get a new loan probably at five seventy-five to six. Um, but even with so a lot of, a lot of these larger REITs. You know, they're just getting, uh, whether it's a line of credit or they're issuing bonds, you know, they had a rate of about 4% on it. And now, you know, even when they go to refinance $400 million of debt, I mean, it's going to be north of five, right? And so going into some of these deals, they're coming in, they're going in cap rates four and a half, and then they're refinancing at five, five and a half. So they're, they even have negative leverage and they have, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 units. Uh, right now. And so they're really buying, you know, on the basis of being lower than replacement costs and that, you know, these rates will come down. Um, all right. So yeah, long-term demand, um, you know, they're talking about job growth, population growth, all the migration trends that you've seen on every pitch uh, from every uh, equity raiser out there. 
Um, but I think this part is the is the key part is that people are going to be in rentals longer. The single family market, um, the prices have not dropped. Um, maybe it's days on market is a little bit longer. Um, but for people to move from apartments to single family is extremely difficult. And the gap between those two, I'll just I'll just pop open this chart, um, is extremely large. Uh, so even in 06 and 07, when you know uh, single family pricing was going up significantly, uh, there's probably an $800 gap. Right now, they're showing a $1,300 gap um, between you know a single family house and you know a class A apartment right now. So, um, but you know some of the headwinds for Real estate investors, they're seeing taxes go up about five percent. Insurance is about 15, 20 percent. Um, but you know, they're seeing overall, um, you know, the in terms of acquisition opportunities, really focus, and this is more on the class A side, is the the stuff that is, you know, merchant builders, developers um struggling with lease up, then they're just gonna have to go. They just can't pay the floating rate construction loan anymore. And, you know, one of the, uh, you know, guys on analysts asked on the call, where do you, where do you think about rates? And they, they estimated, um, about 25 basis points halfway and 25 basis points at the very back end. So 50 basis points total. So they have you down probably at 475 or so, um, on the federal funds rate. All right. So, uh, Marcus and Chap is a broker They're They're across all asset types. Um, you know, they, you know, they, they felt. 2023 was extremely challenging. Um, buyers and sellers, no, nobody wanted to transact, right? Because nobody knew the value. Um, you know, the volume was down about 55%. And a lot of listings, it was just difficult to price, right? So you gave you gave a BOV for 10 million, then you took it out the market, you got bids for eight or nine million, and the seller just said, No, I'm not trading. Um, or it would get under contract at 9 million and then they would get retraded and retraded and retraded oh, and then uh the lender backed out and then you couldn't raise the equity and essentially now now the deal is coming back out a year later right so um you're having to do to remarket the same deal multiple times um people get sort of buyer fatigue deal fatigue on that uh, particular asset and then you go to another broker shop right and it's it's time to to try somebody else right so um you know it's all about sort of timing um, so when a deal does go into contract, uh, you know, figuring out sort of what sensitivities that buyer has in the deal, whether it's, um, how much earnest money they have, where's their equity coming from, all those things are coming into play where, um, you know, brokers are calling us saying, all right, can this person actually close? Because, um, I've already done 30 tours out there and I don't need to do another tour out there. Um, but you know, Marcus actually, you know, spends a lot of time, um, out there in terms of not only the institutional stuff, but the private client stuff. And a lot of the, especially the asset types outside of multifamily, um, they're, you know, they're usually financed, like the smaller deals, let's say the triple net deals, the retail deals, they're usually financed by banks and credit unions. But um, a lot of those guys, you know, the rates ain't a half, 9%, and the cap rates at six or five. And so it just doesn't work right now. And so a lot of a lot of these deals that Marcus Millenchap, especially on the the smaller private client side, they're just saying, look, we need more realistic prices uh, from sellers, and then maybe some maturing debt will put put enough pressure on sellers to bring down the price. Um, and so yeah, the private client space was down about forty five percent, but the institutional guys still pencils down sixty percent, sixty five percent down um, from last year. And so, you know, the private clients usually the first to recover because you can, you know, you can pay all cash for a $5 million retail asset, but it's hard to do that on a $60 million multifamily deal. Uh, but a lot of people goes back to that word replacement cost. Um, you know, these guys built it for 200 a door, or 250 a door, and you're able to buy it for 200 a door. And so that feels good. That feels like, uh, but you still, you still need to deal the cash flow, right? And so you can only be negative levered for so long. Um, so they said in multifamily, you know, there's a bigger, uh, dislocation, uh, just because cap rates came down so fast with those interest rates that came down. Like we talked about at the beginning, um, when rates dropped so much, when you could finance a deal at 3%, you know, so for plus three and so far was zero, then you, you could buy a deal at a three and a half cap 
Um, but now, um, you know, it's come up so much so fast that, you know, cap rates haven't gone eight or nine that fast, right? As as fast as interest rates have gone up. And so that that's caused sort of this, this gap out there um, between buyers and sellers. And so um, I'm going to wrap on the earnings calls uh, with Blackstone, which is the behemoth in the space across all asset types. So they have a trillion dollars of assets under management, which uh, I guess is bigger than any alternative asset manager out there. Um, you know, 12,000 real estate assets. Uh, you know, they they have a pulse on the economy. They're, they're buying everything and seeing everything. Um, so they, they think CPI is already below two. And just, you know, once the shelter costs get adjusted to sort of flat, then uh, you're going to see a 2%. So, they, you know, they're probably three or four months ahead. So hopefully that maintains or is accurate. And so they're calling 2023 the bottom. And, you know, whether that's uh, accurate or not, we'll, we'll wait and see. Uh, but they're calling the bottom. Uh, they think, you know, Fed's done raising rates. They're going to cut in 24, okay? Um, and they think the best investments are made right now during your uncertainty. And, um, you know, it, it is about momentum and they're saying right now, a lot of people are on the sidelines. They took losses. You know, we saw all those deals, all those foreclosures that happened. That's real money out the door, right? That's real LP equity that's gone. And so it's going to take time, right? So everything you see in the, in the, in the wall street journal right now, everything's negative around office, everything's negative around multifamily. And so it takes a while for people to come back to the space. Right. So they're saying, look, in the early 90s, in 08, 09, it was slow. It was slow to get money. But Blackstone's already raised the money. They already have the money. The money's sitting in the bank. Uh, they're already in the funds or all the funds that they've raised. Right. And so they're, you know, they're saying, look, you're going to have a bottoming effect. This is the greatest opportunity for investments. And um, so it's going to take a little bit of time. But, uh, you know, they're looking to take advantage. Um, and here's a couple deals on the bottom that I missed, uh, that, that, you know, whether it's 3.5 billion to take Tricon residential, uh, digital realty, which is data centers. And then they also bought some of the portfolio from signature bank. Um, so they've got plenty of money. I think they, I guess they've got 65 billion to deploy. So they've got money. It's time to go in their space, uh, from their perspective. And so this is probably the most bullish uh, earnings call that it, I heard um, out there. And so um, in terms of, you know, multi, they asked specifically, obviously there's a lot of new supply, uh, probably take about 12 months. And then, but look, there's a housing shortage. They think if you take a long-term view, you're going to be fine. Um, and, you know, they're just going to keep going. So, so they were definitely the most bullish out of everybody in terms of going into the cycle. So, um, you know, going back to that Howard Marks, uh, you know, timing, you know, cheap money, uh, 2020, 2022, uh, you know, people were building and buying, right, in the Sun Belt. So you could buy a deal, it was a 4% cap, whether it was an A, B, or C deal. But then a lot of people just got bid out, right? There was 30 people, 29 people didn't win the deal. And so now what, what did they do? They uh, bought some land and started developing. And so that is what's coming on right now. So if you look at this chart, uh, from real page about 440 units in 2023 the estimate for 2024 is 600 something thousand units um, which goes back to sort of the 70s and past you know think about how many deals uh, that we have in the 80s built in the 80s um, early to mid 80s and you know 2024 is going to top those um, so we're definitely going to see more oversupply more concessions concessions are already in the market across a and b uh, properties. And so you're going to see rent growth to go flat. Uh, but eventually, uh, the developers stop building once the lenders give them money. And so what you see is uh, right here, the number of starts uh, basically goes back to 2020. Uh, so but this is across across the US. And so you see the number of permits going down right now. And so it takes about two years to build a, a property, so and probably another twelve months to lease it up. So you're starting to see stuff in maybe late 25, 26. You're starting to see that that time frame where this supply will finally um, give you give you a chance to catch up, and then 
you know, the rents will come back and the rent growth will come back. And so, um, so that's sort of what we saw across the earnings reports. I wanted to talk about, um, you know, market specific. So this is out of Marcus Millichap, their IPA group, uh, more focused on A stuff. Um, so, you know, you see here in DFW, so they ranked DFW the number one market um, across the nation. Um, you know, one of the things that I just highlighted a couple of things. So Allen McKinney Frisco, sort of North, North Dallas, they have about 18, 19,000 units, which uh, is more than 35 ma major metros in the US. So uh, that's an insane amount of inventory coming. Uh, but, you know, DFW has really transformed into one of the top investment markets across the nation. Um, they, you know, the top three in sort of $20 million plus deals. So um, institutional investors are very comfortable with DFW. Um, in, in terms of all the other markets in uh, Texas. So um, number four on their national ranking was Houston. Um, tons of people still continue to move into Houston, 165,000 um, over the last couple of years. And it's really the relative affordability that is there. Um, you know, the biggest thing that almost everybody is concerned about is insurance down in Houston. Because um, it seems to go up, you know, I think, that uh, that REIT MAA was talking about it going up 15, 20%, but um, in Houston, it's going up probably about 50%. So uh, it's increasing significantly in, in Houston and you just have to build that in. And so, um, you know, sometimes people come down or people go from Dallas and they're seeing a deal, class A deal at 200 a door. A deal in Houston might be 150 a door. And you're saying, what's the difference? Um, one is the rents, but then two is just the insurance cost is significantly higher. So, um, and in Austin, Austin is really um, the amount of new supply coming in in Austin, depending on what report you look at, is considerably higher. Um, you know, they their vacancy is going up on the class A side by about 2%, 170 basis points. The other you know, Houston was only up 30 basis points. Dallas is only up 90 basis points. So Austin's almost double that, right? And so there's a ton of demand. Um, everybody who's renting from 20 to 34 uh, is increasing significantly. Um, that demographic is increasing significantly, but the vacancy is going to hit a 20 year high um, at 8.4%. Uh, but there, you know, obviously there's going to keep building. All the chip manufacturers are there, sort of north, north, uh, east Austin. And um, people are just going to keep moving there. So, um, and then San Antonio came in at number 20. Um, vacancies up here, they're seeing mostly on the uh, Northwest side, they're still seeing uh, the proximity to Austin and just the lower rents, right? So $1,500 class A rents versus 2,100, you know, that's real money. That's $600 difference between San Antonio and Austin. And so, um, you know, I think Austin and San Antonio is just going to keep getting closer and closer together. Um, you know, in terms of my background, I was born and raised in Houston, went to school at UT in Austin, and then uh, been up here in DFW since 2006. I was an underwriter for G Capital sort of through the last uh, financial crisis and then have been focused since 2015 on multifamily and originating loans across, uh, you know, 170 properties, 20,000 units and investing across all four major metros in, in Texas. All right. So on the loan side, you know, whether it's bank loans, Freddie, uh, Fannie, and non-recourse bridge, let's jump in. So, you know, on the bank loans, like like the Marcus and Millichap guys were saying, uh, you know, they have not been as aggressive. They are worried about their own book right now. Um, and so to put out money is still costing eight to nine percent. It's usually smaller deals and usually um it's for existing customers. So um uh, bank loans, we have not done as many. Um, and there's really not as much distress in that space. And so um, the bridge lenders in 21 and 22 wanted to do larger deals, probably 10 million and up in loan amount. And so there has not been a lot of distress on the smaller loan side. And so a lot of these guys, um, where we're seeing issues is if maybe you did a loan five years ago or 10 years ago, and now it's just coming due at the wrong time. And you're having to go from a 5% interest rate to an 8% or 9% interest rate. Um, you know, in that case, you probably just need to go to a Fannie Freddie loan and get to 6 or 7% if your occupancy is there and it qualifies. All right. So Freddie Mac SBL is still doing plenty of these. Um, you know, these are anywhere from 6 to 7% out there, uh, just depending on the affordability, depending on the leverage, depending on the prepayment. Um, this was one that we did 
um, last year and, you know, is on an acquisition and, you know, you fix your rate up front, uh, you got to get, get the deal into Freddie Mac in time, and then they're able to hold that rate through the entire um, loan process. And so you can get, you know, 10 year term, um, six or 7%, and then um, step down prepay and up to 10 years, three years IO on that one. Uh, Freddie Mac still is uh, underwriting, or originating a, l a large number of deals. Um, a lot of people are, did floating rate with Freddie, and they're trying to move over to fix right now just to get rid of the rate cap escrows and you know buying a new cap. Um, and we're seeing BNC stuff obviously get higher leverage uh, just because of the higher cap rates out there. So this was a deal in Longview that had a, Fred, a Freddie floater, uh, moved it over to fix rate, sold the interest rate cap, um, got the escrows back and just sort of reset that deal. Fannie Mae, um, you know, they are uh, still, you know, probably in that 575, the 625 rate. Um, affordability is really important to them. Uh, this was a deal we did, 10-year full-term IO Fannie Mae fixed rate uh, deal. And then, um, you know, for their outlook, you know, they're, they're seeing the same thing that a lot of these operators see in negative rent growth um, due to all the new supply, a lot more concessions. Uh, really just, uh, if, if there is growth is going to be slow and, you know, they're concerned about recession and then, um, maybe by mid 2025, uh, rents are a little bit more normalized and then non-recourse bridge, um, you know, for a deal that maybe, uh, doesn't work with Fannie and Freddie right now, or, you know, there's significant value out that has to be done to a property. Um, you know, there's still a lot of bridge lenders out there. Um, you know, so for plus three to four, um, and then you just have to go out and buy that interest rate cap just to keep your payment in in that rate in that in the let's say five to six percent range. Um, so we're seeing about three percent of the loan amount for one year cap, and then probably six to seven percent for a three year cap. Here's some of the closings that we had in 2023, um, mostly across the board, Fannie and Freddie, a couple one or two non recourse bridges, but did about 540 million. Um, in 2023. And then, you know, in terms of old capital, we're a mortgage broker and we focus in on, you know, Bridge, Fannie, Freddie, HUD, been doing more HUD loans. Um, we obviously put out a podcast, our conference coming up uh, probably in October this year um, and speaker series, um, lunch and learns, things like that. And then we are really a second set of eyes for you, um, whether walking the property, uh, going through the loan process, connecting you with, uh, vendors throughout the space, touring deals. Um, so reach out to us if you have any questions on a deal. Um, upcoming events. So we did a bus tour um, in January, which was very well received and, you know, uh, had about 50 people there. And so the next one is April 17th, 18th. Um, so you can go uh, either go to oldcapitalpodcast.com. There's a link there. Or just join our email list at oldcapital.com and oldcapitallending.com, and you can um, get tickets to that event. And then um, excited to announce this event. So uh, we've done basketball, we've done bowling. Uh, this year we are doing a pickleball tournament um, here in April, April 25th here in DFW. And so sign up your team, uh, and we raise money for a nonprofit called City House here in uh, Plano. Um, so definitely check that out as well. And then, um, so if you want these slides, uh, please just subscribe to the channel, like, like, and comment on this video. And then if you need help with whether it's upcoming loan maturity, a new deal, reviewing a deal as a LP, um, you know, send me an email, uh, with those details. And then, um, if you're interested in joining old capital, send me an email with your resume as well. And, uh, thanks for watching.